Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. It is a real, real honor to be here. Um, I would say I know many of you, but we've all gotten so old, I don't even recognize anyone, even with their masks off. So just re reintroduce yourself to me, and I'll do the same. So uh, of course, I'm thrilled to be here to speak about Southwest Rising. Um, this uh, has been uh, many years in the making, and I'll explain the background to this. Uh, but basically, this project started about six years ago, and probably longer. Uh, it all started when every time I got together with some of the old, um, the old uh, gang, so to speak, um, everybody would say, you know, someone should write a book about Elaine Horowitz. She was such a character. It was such a special time. And in fact, the 1980s for so many people, even if they weren't showing in her galleries, called the 1980s in Santa Fe the Horowitz years. And so that shows you how pivotal she was in the history of art in this region and in Arizona. Um, so it started with that, and of course, I knew how much work it was going to be. And finally, Cattle Track Arts and Preservation came up with money from the Rauschenberg Foundation, and the Tucson Museum of Art partnered with them so that we could make uh, the book a reality. After 250 interviews, countless hours of uh, research, um, uh, it finally came to fruition. But first I want to thank the Horowitz family because without their support uh, of the project, without their wonderful candid interviews, especially Arnold Horowitz, Elaine's husband, uh, we couldn't have had the depth of the background of Elaine and uh, the wonderful stories that came about. So as I said, I worked for four years on the project itself, and as many of you know, I don't know when to stop. I have to include everything I'm afraid somebody will say, but don't you remember this story? So I wanted every story in. So the project got bigger and bigger. I envisioned a book about like this big, you know, the kind you actually can read in a lifetime. And uh, it ended up, as you know, 450 pages or is it 540, something like that. But actually that was whittled down. I call it the doorstop. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> to me, every artist and every story was important. So if you're an artist that showed at Horwich and didn't get in the book, it's not because I didn't want you in there, but someone said you have to stop or you'll have two volumes. Um, but anyway, that was sort of the beginning of it all. But the other thing that was important is that I had two residencies at the Women's International Studies Center here in Santa Fe. And uh, Jordan Young and their wonderful board could not have been more supportive. And those two months that I spent here were completely invaluable to have access to the people to interview, uh, the Santa Fe Reporter, other archives, and so that was a huge help. So I thank them so much. And if you don't know about WISC, you should check them out because they have incredible speakers and they do wonderful things here in town. So basically, um, while I was um, uh, working on the book, our CEO, Jeremy Michalazak, raise your hand, you're right here, uh -huh, said, uh, you know, for all the work you're doing on your free time, you know, you could capitalize on this. He knew that we had a tremendous amount of materials that were from Elaine Horwich galleries because, of course, uh, part of provenance, you keep those labels. And I knew that too. And he said, how hard would it be to put together a show? I said, I could do it over the weekend because I knew the materials so well. So that was the beginning of our exhibition. Of course, I couldn't put it together over a weekend, <laughs> but I got the show, so that was good. So basically, um, then uh, we um, uh, ended up having the show, and of course it put pressure on me to get it done in my lifetime, so that was a really huge thing. Unfortunately, as many people know, after two weeks we had to close the exhibition due to COVID. But I've got to tell you, we had the most amazing exhibition for that short time, and it did reopen again in late August into September. Um, but what we had that was even more important is a lot of the artists had come out for the opening and the Horwich family. So here's a good shot of the, uh, the gang, so to speak, and I think you recognize the dog in the front. And uh, so there it is, a combination of artists and, um, of course, we and the family members. And uh, we um, had the pleasure for that one of having Arizona and New Mexico artists, so people came in from all over. So it was wonderful. I was a little worried. I thought, this is going to look dated. But once everything was up on the walls, just like the exhibition here, it's like it all came back. It was alive. And when people came in to see that show and when they've come to see this show, 
uh, the first thing they say is that it feels like we're just going back into time and that we're at the Elaine Horowitz galleries. So that's really um, gratifying to know. So before I begin, I just, I hate doing these kinds of things, but I want to. Um, I just want you to raise your hand if you knew Elaine Horowitz and then keep your hand up. So if you knew her, raise your hand, okay? Now, on top of that, if you ever bought art from Elaine and didn't necessarily know her personally, add that to the list. Keep your hands all up. Okay, now, raise your hand if you ever worked for Elaine Horowitz. <laughs> See, it keeps going. Uh, raise your hand if you were an artist in the gallery or ever showed or had your work carried by her. It's practically every single person in this <laughs> room, so I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. So you might know stories more than I do or better than I do. Just remember this whole story is what I remember, and remember it was the 80s, so the fact that I can remember anything is a big deal. So. For those of you who are here who didn't buy anything, work for her, were related to her, et cetera, et cetera, um, I'll tell you a little bit about who she was. Uh, she was a major force in contemporary art, a major force, not the, because there's a lot of fabulous women and men artists, uh, gallerists that were a part of this movement, but she was a major force in contemporary art in the American Southwest from the early 1960s until her death in 1991. And she was responsible for launching the careers of literally hundreds of artists from Arizona, New Mexico, and the nation. And she was also developing, uh, instrumental in developing uh, Scottsdale and Santa Fe into successful contemporary art markets. Uh, she fostered the rise of what has been coined New Western Art and Southwest Pop Art. And I'll give you some examples shortly. So how do I know her? Well, there I am thinking I'm all that. Uh, working along with Elaine in Santa Fe, but I worked for her from 1980 until 19, at uh, the gallery till 1994. And during that time, I'm a type A Virgo, I kept copious records, letters, contact information, and uh, all the announcements for every show that I had worked on and others for scores of her artists. So as many of the artists here tonight know, I kept in touch with people and uh, 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 knew how to find everybody, so that was a good thing. So who was Elaine Horwich? Uh, to me, she was fearless and spirited, one of the most confident women I'd ever met, and she was known for this singular cowgirl appearance, especially when she was in Santa Fe. But uh, many a time in Scottsdale, she was a very upscale uh, urban woman with her wonderful uh, Rolex and her fabulous uh, uh, bulgari necklace. But, uh, Whenever she was here, it was uh, he-she necklaces and coral and, and her wonderful hats. Um, everybody who knew her well know that she often carried a pearl-handled Smith & Wesson pistol in her purse. And uh, countless people I know remember individual stories where she whipped that gun out just to either shock her customers or actually, on occasion, attempt to use it. Uh, one time we had a wonderful robbery situation, and in fact, she did pull it out, and we were afraid she might shoot someone. Um, also, a wonderful story about her is that in her blouse was stuffed a big roll of $100 bills, 50s, 10s, and singles on the outside, just in case she needed to buy something. And needing to buy was the operative term for her, from an artist, a trader, or even bikers. I mean, wherever she could buy something fabulous, she did. And many of you got to accompany her on her many trips to the Santa Fe flea market to, uh, at the opera, and uh, it was quite the scene. And as Adrian Horwich remembers, sometimes she'd buy out a whole booth, and three days later it'd be showing alongside a famous New York artist, and uh, she would mark it up ten times. That was the way she rolled. So her Western lifestyle, her keen artistic eye, her grand galleries, and celebrated parties, we all remember those, or some not, um, uh, made her one of the top gallerists in the Southwest. And as I mentioned, she was partly responsible for the Santa Fe look because fashion designers, film and television stars, movie pro producers, and authors often visited her Santa Fe and Scottsdale galleries. Kelly, I bet you can tell some stories about those celebrities. We always swooned when Robert Redford came to the gallery. She also had a 1952 Silver Wraith Rolls Royce, and it sported the license plate Art Gal, which reinforced her persona as, to me as a contemporary Annie Oakley of the art world. So here's her background. Elaine Yvette Sweet 
was born on June 27, 1933 in Chicago, Illinois, and her father was a senior vice president at City National Bank. In the summers, uh, she attended uh, uh, Burr Oaks, which is an exclusive camp for girls in Wisconsin, and during high school and college, she practiced her shooting skills at the Lincoln Park Gun Club in, at uh, Lakeshore Drive. I'd say most of the people practicing their shooting were men, so you can imagine how she stood out. But in 1949, she attended the Rocky Bar uh, O Ranch in Montana, and over a seven-week period, I can't even believe people sent their kids off for seven weeks, but I guess they did that a lot in the summer. Uh, 60 girls from the Midwest went on pack trips into the wilderness, created arts and crafts projects, staged rodeos and parties, and performed a water show to the area residents. Her time in Montana inspired a love of the American West that continued throughout her life. And even if you lived up at her house as an employee during the summer, um, it, uh, the family started dubbing it Camp Horwich because, believe it or not, we learned lanyard making and it was like we were living at a, a, a summer camp, for, really. It, for all intents and purposes, we did arts and crafts and we had a lot of fun. During the 40s and 50s, the Sweet family belonged to the Standard Club, which was a top private club in Chicago at that time. And in 1952, Elaine was dining there when she met Arnold Horwich. Um, he was a synthetic textile engineering major and worked for the family clothing manufacturing business called Dina. And hence, Dina Semler, raise your hand. You were named after the company. In 1953, Arnold and Elaine married. And in 1955, they moved to Arizona where Arnold took over the company's new location in Mesa. And as Arnold told me, or Arnie as we all knew him, uh, they went in the middle of winter and when they got off that plane, they smelled the orange blossoms and they saw the palm trees and it took them about five minutes to decide yes, they wanted to run the company and move to Arizona. In the 1950s, Phoenix and Scottsdale were experiencing an economic population and cultural boom due to the influx of industry, skilled workers, a new freeway, air conditioning, and tourism after World War II. So it was a perfect time to move to Arizona and to open a gallery because people were building like crazy, residences all over the valley, and they wanted to fill their homes with art that reflected the new region. In the 1950s and 60s, however, Elaine wasn't opening a gallery. She was busy raising children. And I think everybody's here, aren't they, today? It's, so that's pretty exciting that the kids are all grown up in here tonight. Um, but she was not only raising children, but playing golf and tennis, riding horses, and shooting skeet. And that story that Carrie told me about taking the kids out with a wrangler to look for rattlesnakes just made me laugh so hard. That, I don't know any mother that does that, but that was pretty cool. So her life changed dramatically, however, when Arnold Horwich read Betty Friedan's 1963 Feminine Mystique. And he got worried. He thought, oh my god, she's educated, she's you know, a strong-willed woman, she's going to get bored being a mother and she will leave me, is the way he explained it. And uh, so he came to her and he said, Elaine, I, I don't want you to leave me, so I want you to get a job. Well, she reacted quite strongly to that. And as I remember the story, she said, what? I raise your children, I keep your house, and now you want me to get a job? Are you out of your mind? He said, think about it. So what she did is she started to accompany him on trips to New York. And uh, while he was busy with business, she visited galleries and museums and auction, auctions, the art auctions, and she suddenly came up with an aha moment plan. She decided she'd open an art business based on the Tupperware model. And think about it, Tupperware just started in like 1948. And she just had this amazing idea, instead of opening a shishi gallery, take the art to the people. And so what she did was she uh, brought prints and, uh, to people's homes, to support groups, um, religious organizations, uh, women's groups, and talked about what is a print, what is art, and then, of course, was happy to sell it to them. In 1964, she invited Suzanne Brown to go into this art business with her, and they called the new business the Art Wagon. And they did so because they loaded up their station wagons with lithographs, etchings, woodcuts, and serographs uh, into their cars, and they took them to these groups to, to talk about art. And to restock their inventory, they traveled to New York City, Chicago, and throughout the Southwest, 
and they bought art by both established artists and new young talent. And they also carried a lot of new Mexico, or new, uh, not new Mexican artists, but the latest um, emerging artists from Mexico. Um, but I also know many artists who recall that she went to their graduate shows at the University of New Mexico, or even in Tucson, and that's how they found their artists. So in 1973, Suzanne and Elaine parted ways uh, over artistic differences. And quite frankly, Elaine by then knew her vision and she knew she wanted to go bigger and she uh, really did want to branch out on her own. So her first gallery under her name was on Main Street in Scottsdale and then later she moved to Marshall Way. And really she single-handedly created that arts district in Marshall Way. What she did that was different than everyone else is she went big. She took the biggest artists, the best well-known, or the ones that were rising stars, and she put in advertising like no other gallery had done. And I spent a lot of time going through every art magazine from that era, and I counted and tabulated every ad she did and who she uh, advertised and whether they were half full or um, you know, full page uh, ads. And uh, one of her biggest artists that she advertised and promoted, of course, was Fritz Scholder. Fritz Scholder, of course, is Luiseno and was born in Breckenridge, Minnesota. And uh, again, not only did she spend tons of money on advertising him, but she also bought him cars. It started as a sports car, and as the story I heard from Ramona Shoulder, uh, he tired of it and gave it to her, so then she bought him a Rolls Royce. Um, of course, then everybody thought they would get a Rolls Royce if they came on board to her gallery, and they saw how famous Fritz was getting, so uh, everybody wanted to show at Elaine Horwich Galleries. In 1961, Shoulder attended the Rockefeller Foundation Southwest Indian Art Project at the U of A in Tucson and received his MFA there. Um, do check out Charlotte Jackson Gallery because Max Cole is showing there and he went to school with her at the U of A and uh, uh, that's how Charlotte Jackson had heard about her work through Fritz Shoulder. He was a wonderful source of uh, recommendations. After graduation, Shoulder joined noted designer and educator Lloyd Kivanu at the Institute of Indian Arts uh, in Santa Fe, and there he taught young indigenous artists, including Kevin Redstar, Earl Biss, T.C. Cannon, and many others. But after seven years, he realized that he was becoming typecast as an Indian painter, and he left the gallery in 1980 because he wanted to branch out and do vampires and his girlfriends and all kinds of fabulous things. And uh, I think Elaine, and especially her assistant, Dickie Felzer, wanted him to keep painting Indians, or indigenous people, as we say today. There she is with uh, Paul Pletka and Fritz Scholder. And of course, Paul Pletka wasn't one of her artists, but she wished he was. Uh, he showed at Yara's Gallery and a number of other uh, prominent galleries in town. But you can, uh, she looks just like Mindy here, or Mindy looks like her, just, it's so uncanny. But there they are in 1977, and that's a huge time because uh, that was the year of the um, Armory Show here in Santa Fe. The 1977 Armory Show uh, really changed the face of uh, art in this, in this town, in this whole state. So in 1975, though, uh, Elaine took on Earl Biss, and that was because uh, he uh, was connected to Fritz Schulder. He recommended people, and, and she was, of course, keeping her finger on the pulse of what was happening. Uh, he was uh, an enrolled member of the Crow Nation and, and of course, considered one of the top rising stars. Um, and uh, uh, he was also a student of Alan Hauser, Charles Lolama, and, interestingly, the architect Paolo Soleri in the mid-1960s. And when she took him on, he had just graduated with an MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute, and he was influenced, as you can see, by Impressionism and Abstract Expressionism, as well as other movements. So um, he, of course, is one of the early artists that defined that new style. And other artists, and now, mind you, this uh, Earl Biss didn't first show here. He showed in Scottsdale, believe it or not. And Billy Shank was the same. Now, Billy Shank lives, uh, Billy, are you here tonight? Ah, thank you. Um, uh, he now lives in La Cienega and shows at Blue Rain Gallery, but originally he came uh, to Arizona. Um, another artist uh, uh, who joined the gallery in 1976 when she uh, branched out on her own in, on Marshall Way. He was a graduate of the Kansas City Art Institute and had been living in New York City, uh, and, and of course everyone knows his uh, hard-edged style, uh, paint-by-numbers techniques, 
using photographic techniques. And uh, what changed his art was uh, when he, in New York, had discovered a cache of spaghetti Western film stills in a shop and began to paint images of this imagined West. And of course, then uh, uh, just sort of exploded from that point on. Um, he was a regular on the rodeo circuit, and he oftentimes, and probably still does, delivered his paintings in his horse trailer. Um, and if he wasn't delivering paintings in his horse trailer, which we always had to dust off his paintings, uh, he came in his 1963 white Cadillac. Everybody loved him because he looked like Mickey Dolan back then, and now you do too. He has his hair still, I'm so impressed. Um, anyway, at that time, once he started working with Elaine, and I think he said, I want to show how fast can I get one, and Paul Jenkins dropped out because of some glitch in the schedule, and he swooped in, and I think he had a sellout show. So uh, in the 80s, he began to work on a series of punk cowgirls and humorous perspectives of the Western good life. And this is an example of one of the tongue-in-cheek text and image, uh, images and a cute picture of him next to his work. Here we are. I'm eating, which I always am doing. I'm off to the right with this weird haircut where I had a point in the center of my forehead. Um, and in the background is a reporter. And there's Bill before his hair turned gray. It's so cute. But uh, we go way back. In fact, all these uh, artists, uh, we remain friends for a very long time. There was also Joe Baker. Now, Joe Baker was actually living in Scottsdale, but he had a presence in Santa Fe. And uh, he's in the exhibition here as well. Um, Joe Baker is from the Delaware tribe, and he joined the Horowitz Galleries in 1983. And what he did is he mixed modern life with indigenous subjects uh, in, in sort of humorous satires. And among these characters at the time were rhinestone rodeo queens wearing heart-shaped sunglasses. I think he named it, one of them Mrs. Fritz, had her riding a pony with a white brassiere. Preppy cowboys, yellow Labradors with Indian headdresses, and brightly colored teepees with television antennas and barbecue grills. Uh, today, he is the um, uh, director of the Ma uh, Massapequa Museum in Mass Mashantucket, uh, Connecticut, and he's working in a very traditional Delaware style of beaded sashes. Um, but he uh, is an incredible um, artist, an incredible curator, and we had him as one of our recent biennial jurors. Um, now, here's an example of uh, how we looked back in the 1980s. Uh, what I wanted to point out is the second from the left with a, with a rather ominous looking mustache was Rudy Fernandez. Many of the artists that she showed were at one time her um, employees, her art handlers, or um, even people just doing the cleanup. And at that time, Chris Pelly, who's now uh, rising, uh, or not rising, but a, a established artist in New York. Uh, he's in the far back. They worked in the warehouse. We called them the warehouse boys back then. Um, so anyway, um, he later uh, uh, showed at Marilyn Butler Gallery, and then finally in the 1980s started to exhibit at Elaine Horwich Gallery. So he got promoted from maintenance worker to a uh, prominent artist on a, a nice, uh, healthy stipend. So uh, he went up in the world. Um, Here's an example of his work. Rudy Fernandez uh, was inspired by Mexican culture and retablos, and he had taught in Mexico City as part of his master's program in Washington State University in Pullman. Um, and as a matter of fact, I worked at Suzanne Brown Gallery before I came to Horowitz Gallery, and she showed him for a brief time. So I first met him um, when I was uh, teaching in Washington State, but again when he came to Scottsdale for the first time. So we, we have intertwining uh, histories. Um, his work is autobiographical in nature. So all these symbols have a lot to do with his Mexican heritage, but also his own life. So the uh, retablo format, and the roses, and saguaros, and trout imagery, that comes from Washington. Knives, ravens, and hearts. But oftentimes in, uh, intermeshed with neon or other symbols of his culture. He was one of the first artists to show in early Chicano exhibitions, including Artistas de Azatlan in Seattle in 1975, Artists of the Southwest at the Gallery uh, de la Raza in San Francisco in 77, and the second Southwest Chicano Invitational at the Heard Museum in 78. And as I mentioned, he came in 81 to Horwich, and he moved to Santa Fe in 1986. Later on, he moved to Dallas, and I'm happy to say that he's now back in New Mexico, and we hope to see more of his work again here in, in our region. 
Now, after she had been establishing herself in Scottsdale, um, during the late 1950s and all during this time, she and Arnold would go to Santa Fe to see the opera. Um, so she loved Santa Fe, and they uh, oftentimes were either at the compound or uh, Marcy Street uh, compound and would rent a place, and she was checking out the gallery scene. And as Dickie Felser used to say, uh, you'll never make it here in contemporary art. Nobody likes contemporary art here, but she showed her wrong. <laughs> so in 1976, she found this space. Many of you know it because it's just about right next door to this museum. And if you don't know it, if you know Patina Gallery, that's the one showing on the left. So she found this gallery. It was a historic building owned by Leonora Curtin Palahemo. Uh, she was one of the ladies of the Asequia Madre House. And uh, if you know Las Golandrinas, that was the family's getaway for the weekend. She established the native market here in the mid-1930s to promote New Mexico folk art and crafts. And interestingly, all those many decades later, Elaine Horowitz also um, championed uh, New Mexico folk arts and crafts intermixed in a very unique way um, with famous New York artists or internationally renowned artists and rising stars of contemporary art here in the Southwest. I mentioned Dickie Felser a couple of times, maybe many of you remember her, and don't take offense, but she was one of her oldest friends and gallery workers. She got paid a dollar a month, I think. Dickie insisted on that because she said, I don't want anybody to think that I'm doing this, uh, I'm a working girl, so I, I get paid. And then she would laugh about it. She also insisted that her kids not uh, have to pay for anything, but I think their mom made them pay for things anyway. <laughs> anyway, Dickie was born into a wealthy family in Chicago, and she called herself, here's the offense part, a Nava Jew, but everybody knew it. She literally uh, embodied and wanted to be indigenous so bad that she dressed in Navajo regalia and uh, wore a gray bun and uh, did a, a heck of a lot of sunbathing so her skin would be darker. So she really just wanted to do that. But during her time, she uh, put countless indigenous children through college. Uh, she supported all of the uh, uh, jewelers under the portal, and then she was the buyer for the jewelry, long banks of jewelry at the Santa Fe Gallery. Now, think about it. This woman worked day and night. She was dealing with New York time uh, all during this time and uh, running two galleries by then in uh, uh, Scottsdale and then this gallery that was hugely popular. And during that time in 1978, she built a new gallery. And this was a very special gallery in Scottsdale that had uh, a very well-known well architect who designed it just for her, George W. Christensen. So during that time, not only did she so show some of the people that you see upstairs, um, the New Mexico artists, but uh, she showed uh, some of the greatest artists from the 20th century, from Larry Rivers to Louise Nevelson to Georgia O'Keeffe. It became the premier art destination for artists, celebrities, curators, and collectors. And I can tell you the same uh, here. Uh, no one wanted to take a day off because we were afraid we'd miss a celebrity or some important person. So uh, she was happy that we didn't want to ever leave, of course. <laughs> And then, in 1982, she opened another gallery in Sedona, Arizona. There she focused on Arizona artists, but also New Mexico. So what this did for the artists in New Mexico is that by intermixing her artists, not only did they start to show alongside nationally prominent artists, but they had a double and triple market. So that really helped their economy and their ability to create more work. One such artist that showed in all three galleries was John Fincher. So here he was again before the gray hair sets in, uh, in 1978. And uh, that was around the time that Hill's Gallery closed. Now he was one of the artists who showed in the 1977 Armory show at the, uh, at the Santa Fe Armory. And uh, so he was recommended by Hill's Gallery to come here. And he had uh, amazing stories uh, about his time with the Horowitz Galleries. An example of his work is the piece here in the show called Silence Number no. 3 from 83. Uh, now this one doesn't show the Western tropes, but go to see Llewellyn Gallery and you can see some of those examples. He painted boots, saddles, spurs, lassos, knives, and cacti in brilliant colors and expressive brush strokes. And he treated objects of Western culture like fetishes. 
Uh, he made trompe l'oeil paintings of collages, and Elaine loved his bravado, his mastery of painting style, but also his tongue-in-cheek look at the American West, those icons. Uh, so uh, he was one of her favorite artists, and uh, not one of the, well, he was a bad boy, but he wasn't quite as overt as Tommy Palmore, who's here. Raise your hand, Tommy Palmore. <laughs> we're just going to save that for, uh, I think, November 6th, we're doing the bad boys of Elaine Horwich, so you'll get to hear dirt then. So uh, Fincher soon found how frustrating it was to deal with her. She was so popular that people would stand in line to meet her, buy something from her, or um, get money. So as he said, and, and I quoted in the book, you'd have to wait four minutes just because the phone calls never stopped and she'd be eating a donut, having a cigarette, and putting on lipstick all at the same time. I finally started making morning appointments at her home over breakfast where I could get her attention. She also showed Douglas Johnson, another Santa Fe Armory uh, 1977 artist. That was over, uh, I think, 120 artists, but those are the key people that changed the face of contemporary art here. He was raised in California, but he spent time in the late 60s living in a hogan on the rim of the Canyon del Muerto on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona while he worked for the Peace Corps. He attended dances, ceremonials, and healing rites, and those experienced with the Diné greatly affected his art to come. And he worked in a very fine miniature style, and this is one of the pieces in the show. In 1970, he moved to Santa Fe and began to exhibit his paintings um, uh, and uh, also being a part of the uh, exhibitions here in the museum. Uh, so anyway, he was one of her prominent artists, and like many of her artists, they all had similar interests. He loved cars, and he often delivered his paintings to the Horwich Gallery in a shiny red Corvette. So they all had their famous cars. Woody Gwynn. Now, Woody Gwynn was there for about two years before moving on to another gallery. Many of these artists would hop around galleries depending on how much advertising or sales or attention they would get. And uh, uh, many of them did decide to leave because they didn't like that there were 200 artists in her um, roster of artists, but of course she had many spaces to fill with art. Uh, but Woody Gwynn joined Horwich Galleries in 1978, and he exhibited both in Santa Fe and Scottsdale for the next two years. And of course, we're, he's known for his paintings of the open landscape of the Southwest, and uh, uh, Texas born, he grew up in West Texas, where his family had been ranchers. Uh, you can see his work at Llewellyn Gallery, uh, a couple of really nice pieces. Uh, and uh, then for many years, he was represented by Llewellyn Galleries. Now, there's another artist in the show who's uh, not a New Mexico artist, but he had quite a presence here, and, and I think still does, and that's Otto Decker. And what's special about Otto Decker for this one is that uh, he had uh, this uh, piece that, that he had done of T.C. Cannon, so I love this piece. But uh, he met Elaine Horwich in 1976, and he met Elaine through Fritz Schulder, who had been at an exhibition with him at the Oklahoma Art Center in Oklahoma City. And he painted these realistic figures on masonite cut in the shape of the figure's outline, including housekeepers, butlers, drifters, and artists. And then later he added bathrobes, leather jackets, and other subjects to his repertoire. Uh, he told me he was the first artist to ever stay overnight in a fancy new big uh, Adobe house on Circle Drive, but I think Billy Shank thinks he was there first. I'm not sure. Um, but he was known for his painterly mastery. Elaine loved uh, hyper-realism. She loved realism, but she was also fond of abstraction. But she loved a good painter, for sure. Um, and he was such a, a wonderful, um, humble sort of person. And he told a story once of saying, looking at, uh, I won't even name the name, but uh, some local artist with a long ponytail and all the jewelry and tricked out in Santa Fe style. And he said, uh, Elaine, maybe I, should, uh, maybe I should look more like that. Would I be more popular? And she said, just keep in your lane. You're doing fine. <laughs> she didn't want him to, to change and, and liked him being humble. Um, here he is, Tommy Dale Palmore. Um, he was one of Elaine's favorite artists, born in Ada, Oklahoma, and he joined the gallery in 1980 after moving to Philadelphia, from Philadelphia to Santa Fe. And I think he told this story earlier that he had actually been doing a, a visiting teaching gig in Texas and was literally on his way back through Santa Fe um, 
before he headed back to Philadelphia. And she, I think he'd already met her at an art fair back east, um, so he had you know, made acquaintance with her. In fact, at one point, I think he thought he was talking to Dickie Felzer, uh, but he wasn't. Um, but he's known for these tongue-in-cheek photorealist paintings of gorillas and other animals in stage poses against unlikely backgrounds. And as he says, he's not a, a wildlife painter. He is a, a painter of animals, but in a very uh, satire kind of tongue-in-cheek cheek way. Uh, so that's why you see the shadows, not an animal in the landscape, but in an implied landscape. So it's sort of a twist on the imagery. So once he uh, moved here, um, he was not only uh, the funster in town, but he painted uh, portraits of animals of the region, like uh, bulls. He was known for getting special commissions from the big ranchers or from Atlantic Richfield Corporation. But he did mountain lions, bobcats, and bison uh, positioned against these unlikely backdrops. And uh, he enjoyed going to uh, places with Elaine, and she loved to go out with him. Uh, for instance, one time uh, she uh, went with Palmore to hear a singer playing at the Roadhouse in Golden, New Mexico. And when they arrived at the bar, um, realizing how rough the place was, he was a little protective and asked Elaine, you've got your gun, right? And she said, always. <laughs> I love that one. There he is with James Havard. This was a shot I took years ago uh, when we would all go out to the polo fields. Of course, the girls went out to see Sam Shepard, um, but uh, it was quite the fun thing to do at the time. James Havard uh, was also one of her favorite artists and, of course, one of the bad boys. And um, this is an example of his piece in the show. He joined the gallery in 78, so a couple years actually before Tom did, and moved from New York to Santa Fe in the early 1980s. Uh, he left his loft in Soho, and David Letterman ended up owning it. So uh, I think uh, I had the pleasure of visiting and staying there once uh, when I was coming to visit Tom and Mary Fran uh, when we traveled to New York. Um, he was known as an abstract illusionist, although that was a, a term he really didn't like too much. But he infused his work with references to indigenous cultures in the late 70s. Um, he was a wonderful collector of indigenous materials, and that was one of the things that he, he and Elaine had in common. And they oftentimes would uh, you know, talk to each other, and she would sometimes buy things at auction for him and trade for his paintings. Uh, he attended the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, like Tom Palmore did, in the early 60s. And there he experimented with pop art and with minimalism, and uh, again, these uh, subtle references to indigenous culture. Um, so uh, that was uh, one of the key artists in her roster of artists. And Brian Blunt, are you here tonight? Raise your hand. Yes, you're here too, yay. Um, we're gonna hear from all these guys in November. Brian Blunt came through Santa Fe in 1978 and he was really on his way to Los Angeles uh, after a stay in San Miguel de Allende. Um, he meant to just pass through, but he was looking at the plaza and found a 2,000 square foot studio and it was once the Masonic Ballroom and decided to stay. And we're all glad he did because we had some tremendous parties with that guy. Um, but he quickly joined the Horowitz Galleries and became ingrained in the artistic circles there. He had attended the Haystack School of Arts in Deer Isle, Maine, Penland School of Art uh, Crafts in North Carolina, and the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And he's known for these torn paper chalk pastel that he made himself on uh, paper torn paper referencing canyons, very lovely colorations. And this is one of the more stunning that I've seen, but I, I love all of the works with their subtle shifts of pastel color. This one is definitely um, more uh, dramatic in, in the coloration. In 1981, he moved to Galisteo, where he became part of an exclusive art community there, including Fritz and Ramona Shoulder, Woody Gwynn, Priscilla Hoback, and Lisa Sherman, who was the local art uh, reviewer in town. So there we are. There he is in the 1981. Again, we had the dark hair at one time. Great. And here we are in 2020 at the opening of um, the Tucson Museum of Art exhibition. Um, so uh, that, I was thrilled that they came out for the show. Also, Dad, uh, Dad, listen to me, Bob Daddy O. Wade, and he came to the Horwich's Santa Fe Gallery in 1982, as he said, with a rolled up lit photolithograph of a cowgirl. As he recounted in his book, um, 
uh, that uh, recently came out. She grabbed it out of my hand, ran across the gallery to a group of loud Texans, and told a rich rancher lady she must have it. And that's really how she sold stuff. She'd say, oh, you should have one of these. I have 10. And they all wanted what she had. Uh, you could talk forever about someone's artistic merit or their, their uh, place in art history, and they'd run over and say, I want to buy from Elaine. She was more fun. The woman bought it on the spot, he said. Guess I had just joined the Horowitz Gallery. Wade became enamored with the stereotypes of the West through the stories of his second cousin, Roy Rogers, and Saturday matinees at the cinema. He took weekly trips across the border to Juarez to get haircuts with his dad, where he was exposed to such tourist souvenirs as velvet paintings, wooden snakes, and stuffed iguanas, which later became an essential part of his imagery. So this is a classic example of his work. There he is, unfortunately, passed away before our show could open in 20. Uh, 19, and uh, we will miss him dearly. He was quite a character, lived for many years in Austin before his death. I don't know if Bunny's here tonight, but Bunny Tobias has a different story than a lot of the other people. Um, she came to Elaine Horwich in 1977, and uh, she was one of the early artists. And unlike a lot of the men artists that had trouble getting paid, and it's mainly because um, I think for the most part Elaine didn't want them to be spending money on what she didn't want them to spend money on. Um, but she got yearly stipends, or, or maybe monthly stipends, always was paid on time and got yearly exhibitions. Um, and she treated the women with utmost respect and support. And if you counted her roster of artists, uh, men and women, it was 50-50 down the line. So she was really one of the first supporters of women in the arts in this area and very big uh, supporting women gallerists as well. So during this time, Bunny made colorful vessels that made reference to history and popular culture. She primarily worked in porcelain at that time, but they were this combination of Pueblo pottery styles and, and such things as this Disney uh, scenario or sometimes Memphis design. So she'd do a play on art history. She was born in Brooklyn, New York, and graduated from the New York School of Visual Arts and honed her skills in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico, and San Francisco. She moved to Santa Fe in 1972 with her husband, Charles Greeley, and he was uh, also one of Elaine's artists and is in this, uh, this exhibition. Um, and now they live, and for many years have lived, on this mountain property in Glorieta Pass. Another artist that was very important to Elaine was David Bradley, and David came mainly because he knew Fritz Scholder showed here. He came to the city in the late 70s to attend the Institute of American Indian Art after a two-year stint in the Peace Corps and joined Horwich Galleries in 81. Uh, he was the youngest artist in the gallery to be given a solo exhibition and became one of her top sellers. I remember at some point, and I'm sure a few of the employees here would remember, it was like a grocery store checker. It was just a madhouse of sales. Uh, by the time he could bring in the work and put them on the floor getting ready to install them, people would be lining up. And I remember saying at one time, everyone, ladies, gentlemen, grab your paintings and come up to me. I'll be with you shortly. And we would just write invoice after invoice, one after another. Um, Bradley's paintings commented on the commercialism and clash of cultures in New Mexico with humorous yet unflattering scenes of flabby and scantily clad tourists overdressed celebrities and stodgy wealthy socialites interacting as bemused indigenous people looked on. His works were like history paintings telling the story of Santa Fe in that era. And there's David Bradley today, uh, very much acclaimed in this area. I think there was a big tribute to him and a retrospective exhibition in recent years. One of Elaine's favorites, of course, was George O'Keefe. She, everybody knows her background, I almost don't even want to tell you about it, born in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. One of the top artists came out in the 1940s at the first uh, invitation of Major, Major, Mabel Dodge Luhan. And during uh, the 1980s, she brokered, brokered more than 14 paintings, many of them in collaboration with Gerald Peters, who is really the top dealer in O'Keeffe's work and an authority. Um, but during that time, uh, she would do anything to get close to um, George O'Keefe. Um, of course, O'Keefe came out as early as the 1930s, and she moved to the village of Abiquiu in 49. Um, Elaine would hire people who were close to Juan Hamilton. Um, she would drive up to Abiquiu to purchase works directly from her or from Juan, 
and she would uh, do secondary market brokering with uh, people who owned her work. Um, so she was very enamored with her work and uh, uh, enjoyed many different interactions. So during the 1980s, things really took off for Elaine Horowitz. She was already big in the 70s, but by the 80s, business was absolutely booming. She bought this massive house on uh, Circle Drive and th started to throw these legendary Indian market parties. Uh, the house was built in the 1930s and two foot thick adobe walls. It was uh, truly remarkable. She started to go to major art fairs around the country and was featured in several life lifestyle magazines. So this is the back view of the family house. I, in particular, loved it because it had uh, apricot orchards and cherry orchards, and I would make 10 pies at a time, and uh, everybody enjoyed them. There's an example of some of her special uh, invitations. They were always thematic, and the family would help decide and, and would dress up in costume, and sometimes uh, the the uh, various attendees would um, dress up as well. Um, and uh, the food was unbelievable. And Deborah Avern, are you here? I think you put together a lot of the, thank you, put together a lot of these parties. And Nancy Silver was always doing the graphics and helping with the parties, and she's here tonight. So a lot of uh, work came into this, and it was like a year's worth of work. But you can see how irreverent and silly she was. So sometimes it was a cafe theme, or a Wild West theme, or a, a political theme. And uh, uh, so a very important time. And anybody who uh, even remotely found out about these parties would beg to be on the list. And interestingly, I was one of the people who kept the party list, so people like me for that alone. And uh, my mom saved letters that I would write listing all the celebrities that were coming to the party and how thrilled I was to meet them. So that could verify what I remember. There she is. In uh, 1980, she had her own uh, plane that she partnered with Steve Hawkhouse, who owned her, uh, or who owned uh, Portfolio Framers, and she would fly around in her private plane between Sedona, Santa Fe, um, uh, Scottsdale, and uh, later in Palm Springs. And there's a picture of her Rolls Royce. And the gas station where you're seeing it parked is what's now a three-story gallery complex at the end of the street here. There she is on a, a spread from National Geographic in 1982. Uh, it was all about Santa Fe and Santa Fe style. And there she is with Tom Palmore in a great cowboy hat and dark hair, and Otto Decker and Dickie Felzer and Mel Felzer, uh, having a wonderful time in her fabulous dining room. Um, she was the person people wanted to cover in these national spreads, from W Magazine to National Geographic to um, Town and Country Magazine. Here's a shot that I'm showing a little leg here on the left. Um, uh, Robert Plant, for those of you who remember him. John Morrison, who was one of the promoters of Woodstock. Uh, the woman in white on the right was the bureau chief of W Magazine and my roommate at the time. And um, Char, if you know Char and Cher Designs, the wonderful leather clothing designers. And uh, this was a typical day in the galleries. There wasn't a day go by that there wasn't a celebrity in. And everybody was buying and interacting, and it was quite fun. Then in 1986, she found a 15,000 square foot building on North Palm Canyon Drive and opened yet another gallery, as if she didn't have enough to do. It was built originally in 1929, and it was the original garage for the El Mirador Hotel. So this is where the uh, um, Rolls Royces and the other limos were uh, parked um, while the uh, hotshots from uh, Hollywood would come out and stay at the El Mirador. So uh, the chauffeurs stayed in these little cubicles above the garage, and that became uh, Elaine and Arnold Horowitz's uh, private apartment. Above the galleries, she had 34 more square feet of living quarters, and we all begged to go over there to work so we could stay in that wonderful place. Um, during that time, more than 30 artists and 900 collectors flew in from all over the country to participate in the grand opening. But what I remember as one of the most important times was uh, when she had, in 1989, the pivotal show uh, Harleys and Indians exhibition, and uh, Nick Seeley, one of the employees, spray painted on the wall Harleys and Egos because we all started fighting about how the show should look, so it was kind of funny when he spray painted that on the walls. Um, but anyway, um, this was one of the most important shows she did. This was before the, um, Charles Falco did the big 
um, show at the, at the Getty, so uh, quite a wonderful, or Guggenheim, I'm sorry, was it the Guggenheim? Um, so she was showing motorcycles as art long before others had been thinking about it that way. Um, there were, like I said, hundreds of people that came in for the opening. There was a special showing of uh, famous celebrities' motorcycles, including the president of Harley Davidson. Uh, Sonny Bono's bike was on display, and uh, 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 as I said, Willie G. Davidson was there signing autographs. The show later went to Santa Fe, but it also went to the Aspen Arts Center in Colorado. So this was really the heyday, and there's a Tom Wesselman in the background. And uh, Ronnie Greenberg, a St. Louis gallerist, is off to the right. So in 1991, things were going crazy. It was just a wonderful time, and she often showed the work of Larry Rivers. There she is. She had flown him in and his whole jazz band to perform at the opening. And there's uh, Larry Rivers off to the right, and Elaine is admiringly listening to the music. Um, and the band was called the Climax Jazz Band. And so she was doing quite well at that time. This was in September of 91. Three weeks later, she uh, came to Santa Fe to see the opening for the work of Susan Hertel, another one of her favorite artists. Now, Susan Hertel, uh, like I said, was one of her top artists and one of uh, Robert Redford's favorite artists to collect. And she had gone to school in 1948 at Scripps College, and she was an intern and an assistant for the noted WPA artist Millard Sheets. And later, she became a studio assistant for 25 years. But she moved to Cerrillos to a ranch in the early 80s. And that's when her work became focused on intimate details of her home, studio, and the horses that she loved. So after the opening, normally she would be taking people to go bowling or out to a wonderful dinner. And she said, you know, I'm not feeling well. I think I'll go home. And that evening, she passed away in her sleep. So it was a very uh, just shocking time she died. Uh, at, at 58 years old, and her anniversary was on the 21st of this week, so the family came out to honor her and remember her at that time. It was heart-wrenching for countless artists and staff because we knew our lives were going to change dramatically. Uh, this is a drawing that was in the Scottsdale Progress, and there she is riding off on a motorcycle to the pearly gates, and it says, Horwich's Angels. I'm going to cry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you guys. Anyway, it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And uh, during that time, one of the things that people remarked is that, indeed, it was uh, going to be a, a sea change for everyone. Um, but uh, they also had a, a wonderful um, a memorial service uh, where, actually, she uh, was on the stage uh, in her latest purchase draped in um, uh, a, her closed casket draped with a, one of the latest quilts she had bought. And the whole auditorium was filled with uh, the mourners. Uh, she had gotten her latest uh, acquisition at the flea market, so it was a fitting uh, tribute to her. Um, so uh, basically, uh, it was uh, noted in the press uh, the, that one of the members of the press said, a lot of the bereaved were artists and would have worn black anyway, even if they hadn't been headed for a wake. They stared sadly at the casket on the auditorium stage, the one covered in a bright folk art quilt that was Horwich's last flea market find. They stood around in the lobby afterwards, the men in pleated pants and ponytails. Doesn't that spell the era? Uh, stood around on the cusp of a new age of art in Arizona, one that had begun before Horwich died, but is far more noticeable because she's gone. Stood around talking about the end of an era. So soon after, she, uh, there was a memorial service here in Santa Fe, right here in this auditorium. And the same thing, mourners spoke about how she touched their lives, uh, hundreds of artists and collectors and local business owners, how much she meant to them and had such a charismatic presence. Um, and of course, the gallery operated for a few more years and then merged with Lou Allen Gallery. And then it's still alive today and doing wonderful work supporting many of the same artists. Uh, but the art scene was forever changed with her passing. Of course, many new things have come about in Santa Fe. We're very proud of all the artists and the gallerists that kept the spirit going. Um, but uh, it was a very pivotal time. And many people thought of uh, Elaine Horwich as a very shrewd art dealer who only cared about sales, but that's far from the truth. In reality, her passion for selling art was not about the money. She didn't need the money. It was about the thrill of the chase, 
the art of the deal, and the satisfaction of building the careers of all these artists in the Southwest. So um, we are all proud to be a part of that era, those of us who are there, and uh, I, I'm so glad that we get to see that all together by looking at this wonderful exhibition here at the New Mexico Museum of Art. So thank you very much.